Good evening, everybody. I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University, and welcome to our weekly virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. Uh, whether you're watching us on Crowdcast, Facebook Live, or C-SPAN, we're really glad that you could join us uh, for this discussion. Uh, to those of you new to one of our events, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training, and we facilitate research and discussions like this on women in politics. So with less than two weeks to go until the election, we wanted to get an update on the work that several Republican groups are doing to elect more GOP women to Congress. A few weeks ago, we got an update on the Democratic side from the leaders at EMILY's List. So tonight, we're looking forward to hearing from the women on the other side of the aisle, as we say in Washington. So we're excited to have with us two friends of WPI, AU alum Julie Conway, who is the executive director of VUPAC, and Rebecca Schuler, the former executive director and now an advisor and board member of Winning for Women. So thanks to you both for being here. Before, thanks, we, start, sure, before we start, I wanna let everybody know that um, we're gonna save some time for questions. So at the bottom of your screen, you will uh, notice a button to ask a question. So please uh, feel free to do so during the course of our discussion. And you'll also be able to upvote um, other people's questions that you're interested in. Uh, and if you miss any of the discussion or you want to share it with your friends, uh, replay will be available at the same Crowdcast link you use to register. Um, so Julie, Rebecca, welcome. Um, so with less than two weeks to go, um, let's rewind the clock a bit uh, to 2018, the 2018 midterms, which was not a great year for Republican women. Um, in fact, the 36 new women elected to the House, only one was a Republican. Um, and the total number of Republican women in the House fell to 13, uh, which was the lowest point uh, in the last two decades. So that's compared to the 88 Democratic women currently in the House. So needless to say, you guys have had your work cut out for you um, in the last two years. So I just wanted to start to see if each of you could give us a sense of your organization and what your overall strategy has been uh, these last two years to kind of close that gap uh, as much as possible and what your forecast is um, in the next few weeks. So um, Jules, let's start with you. Yeah, so as Betsy said, I run VUPAC, which stands for Value in Electing Women. Um, you know, the, the only good news about 2018 is that the bar is set pretty low for 2020. So uh, we're expecting great things in, in 13 days. Um, we've been working really hard and we, we've got great candidates. Um, as I'm, I'm sure most of you have read, it has been a record year in terms of uh, Republican women signing up to run for, for federal office. Um, 228 is the magic number, which is about twice what it, what it was before and our all time high. Uh, out of those 228, we have 94 women uh, running for the US House, which is extraordinary. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, the reality continues, though, that, has, as Betsy said, there are a lot of Democratic women in the House. And so it's going to take us uh, probably a few cycles to, to get to some sort of parity. Uh, but we know we're going to make some inroads this cycle. And we have some great women running. Uh, probably we have five to seven that are really heavily favored to win already, which puts us in a, in a pretty good spot, uh, spot to start. And that doesn't even get into more of the competitive races. I don't know how deep you want to go on that. Maybe I'll kick it over to Rebecca to give her brief and then we can get into more specific races. Yeah, Most yeah, because I want yeah, let's, um, yeah, let Rebecca talk a little bit. And then I'm really curious about some of those Republican women to watch um, as the, you know, election clock clicks down and um, as we're watching all the news and election returns coming in. So, um, yeah, Rebecca, give us a little bit on winning for women. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you again, Betsy, for having us today. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's events like this that do show both sides of the aisle and the the momentum that's behind Republican women, that's incredibly helpful for us all to get this message out as well. Um, as you mentioned, um, I'm deeply involved with an organization called Winning for Women. Um, under that auspice, we have a few organizations. Um, we have a C4 Winning for Women, um, a Connected PAC, and then also a Super PAC um, Winning for Women Action Fund. So Winning for Women was founded um, end of 2017 to come in and work with organizations like UPAC um, and others. Um, e, you know, you've probably also all heard of uh, Elise Stefanik's EPAC um, mm -hmm. and Right Now and some others, really to try to come in and, and correct that heavily, heavily, you know, sort of imbalance 
uh, ratio of, of GOP women um, in the House and Senate. Um, I think that we personally saw 2018 as a true rallying cry um, when we saw those numbers dip down to 13 and then dip even further with two retirements to 11. Um, you know, that really showed, I think, all of us the true need for smart, efficient, you know, well-run organizations that could come in and do just this, identify, recruit, um, get these women in, and then figure out how to help them through that election cycle. And I know we'll get into all of this. Um, but, you know, I think that where you've seen a real deficiency on the GOP side is just this surround sound support that, frankly, the left has been pretty good at doing for the last several decades through organizations like Emily's List and others. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're here to make sure that our women are getting the same support. How have you gone about of, you know, what you were saying is like finding and recruiting um, some of the women to run this year? Yeah, um, you know, that's a really good question and one that I think has just been something that's plagued um, our side for quite a while. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think Julie's a real standout in, in developing those relationships and identifying, um, you know, candidates early. You know, I think one mm -hmm. of the, the true factors that creates challenges for us is that when you don't have a bench, you know, and you're not looking a few election cycles out, Right. And you aren't going to have the women when the opportunity comes out. So, you know, for us at Winning for Women, and I know Julie's been doing the same, you know, the day before Election Day 2018, we were trying to look at a map, figure out, you know, where were our opportunities, where were some great candidates that we would hear word of mouth um, through state legislatures, through organizations looking at both state and federal levels, et cetera. And we would go talk to them. Um, and I think, you know, again, as Julie mentioned, you've seen some real dividends this year. Um, we're at record numbers of women who have filed to run as Republicans. Um, that has translated into record numbers of women now running in the general. Um, you know, there are some success stories in an otherwise kind of quirky year. Um, I do think we are seeing a positive um, with Republican women candidates, particularly in the House. And Julie, why do you think that there has been this uptick? Do you think that 2018 was that was that wake up call or what are the other reasons for uh, the definite increase in Republican women running this, this cycle? Yeah, I, I think that it was a definite wake up call. I think that a lot of Republican women saw the Democratic women um, get elected. And yeah. once they started to serve, they realized that the things those Democratic women were talking about it wasn't the things that our Republican women were talking about. And so in order to counterbalance that, they said, look, I can't complain about this. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise my hand and run myself. And we hadn't seen anything like that before. In the spring of last year, um, probably through March, April, I talked to more Republican women considering running than I did during the entire 2018 cycle. It was incredible. <laughs> and, I, and I think the other part is, you know, there's been a foundation that's that 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 has been built. Um, you know, it's taken us a long time to till the ground, as Rebecca said. UPAC's been around since 1997. Um, we've always got involved in primaries. That has always been where we started. You know, there's no way to get a woman, you know, into a general election unless she wins the primary. It's the math is pretty simple. Uh, right. But unfortunately, you know, UPAC couldn't win a race with only us. And so it's not until you have more organizations like Rebecca's, like Winning for Women and, you know, EPAC and all the Republican women in the House and Senate that are actually giving back to help candidates, it makes a big difference. And, and we've definitely seen that success this year. There's always a lot written about, well, Republicans historically shy away from, you know, gender politics, identity politics. Has that really been a factor? And I guess if so, you know, why is that maybe now changing? I'll take it. Uh, yeah, it, it's it has been a problem. Um, the party has stayed out of primaries. Um, mm -hmm. And sadly, the, the concept of that is fine. You know, let the let the best man win. You know, unfortunately, often the best the best man is win and he's at a disadvantage. And so, you know, there, there needs to be some leveling of the playing field. And a lot of that has to do with, with fundraising. A lot of that has to do with the institutional support that female candidates get. And I think we've started to build that. And I think that, you know, if you really have the eye on the prize on who's going to be the best candidate in November, you have to start paying attention to the candidates running in the primary. And, right. you know, sometimes the best candidate is a guy, but oftentimes the best candidate is a woman. And so we need to make a concentrated effort to go in there and give her all the support necessary so that not only does she win the primary, but everybody's already behind her heading into the general so it can be truly competitive. Um, Rebecca, does Winning for Women get involved in the primaries um, in, that early as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's and in fact one of the the major tenets of our strategy is to do just that. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll bring up a race that everyone kind of at times wants to hide a little bit <laughs> under, but um, you know, winning for women. We, we launched our action fund last year to deal with a mm -hmm. special election down in North Carolina. Um, there was what we felt to be, and I, I know Julia did as well, an exemplary candidate um, named Joan Perry. You know, it turned out that she did not ultimately triumph in the special. Um, but that said, you know, here was someone who, to exact, you know, Julie's exact fact pattern, like we saw this wonderful candidate who without some outside support just wasn't going to get any recognition and have zero tools to be able to come through and make a real run. Um, so, you know, I know we got involved, Julie got involved, um, the women members got involved. And while we didn't triumph, I think it was really a clarion call to what we could do, especially if we learned how to work together, um, came in and gave her the publicity and the, the outside group support and all of that that she needed. Um, and I think that that example really set up, you know, some of our action yeah. then in 2019 and 2020. What did you, yeah, what lessons did you guys take away from that race too? Because if I recall, um, during that primary, she was actually, I mean, the, the mode of attack against her, right, was that she might compromise too much, that she wasn't as conservative enough. Yeah. Um, and and do you see that sort of amongst women candidates in general, um, them getting tagged as being maybe too much, too far, too much in the middle, especially when they're running in districts that may be much more conservative? I do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And, and that, I mean, you're, you're right, you're, you're, you are spot on. That was a perfect example of, I mean, I, I would argue, and I think Rebecca would, that quite frankly, Dr. Perry was probably more conservative than, than the gentleman that ended up winning. And it's just mm -hmm. more because she's a woman. And, and people assume that if you have, you know, two resumes next to each other, one of a man and one of a woman with the exact same qualifications, if you're gonna have one that's more conservative, it's gonna be the man. And in this case, it certainly wasn't the case, but sort of the old patterns emerged there. And I think a couple of things happened to your point out of that, even though we lost it, we learned a lot. Um, so Winning for Women and VUPAC and EPAC, we all, we all work hand in glove now, which really wasn't the way of the past. You know, there weren't the outside groups trying to, to trying to support Republican women that actually work together to share our information. I mean, right. we talk all the time. And yeah. you know the idea that when we work together, we can accomplish great things. And so UPAC has historically been the hard dollar, early support of candidates, winning for women, though doing the hard dollar, their wheelhouse is really the, the independent expenditures coming in from the outside, providing you know, a lot of air cover for these candidates. And Elise has, has used her, uh, Congresswoman Stefanik has used her leadership pack to really put the marker in the sand and say, these are our candidates that I care the most about trying to get her colleagues to follow, follow that lead. And so between the three organizations, uh, we've really made great headway this cycle. And I think that, you know, the other thing that I'll point out is Elise Stefanik was the first woman to ever chair the recruitment committee at the NRCC in 2018. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge difference because, you know, we might have looked for women before, but if we had a self-funding guy, then that, that, that seat was off the table. We immediately yeah. go someplace else, even if there was a woman there that would be a tremendous candidate. And so follow that up in 2020 with Susan, Congresswoman Susan Brooks chairing right. recruitment, uh, it makes a big difference to make sure that if conceivably there is a qualified, credible, viable woman willing to do this in a district where the woman is going to be the strongest candidate, that we really looked for her or listened mm -hmm. when people called, even, a, even if we already had someone in that seat. And that's made a big difference. And to those of you guys who are interested, we actually talked to um, Congressman Brooks a couple of uh, maybe one or two months ago about the NRCC and the recruitment effort uh, specifically on women. So if anybody's um, interested in that. But I wanted to ask you too, Rebecca, along those same lines, uh, Julie mentioned Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. You know, as we recall, when she first announced EPAC, she had some pushback right from yep. some Republican men in leadership, which she quickly shut down. Um, but do you think that there's maybe been an attitude change? Have you seen signs of an attitude change from sort of the uh, Republican leadership component? I do. I do. Yeah. Um, I mean, first and foremost, if you look at, you know, there are some stats out in the last you know, few days that show that in the bulk of our, you know, Republican opportunity pickup seats, you've got mm -hmm. diverse candidates predominantly women. 
you know, I like, how can you ignore that? It's, you know, again, they, they, they're winning, they're, they're doing well. Um, I think the, I think the country wants to see a different electorate. And accordingly, you know, I think that there's been a real change and I, I have to give leadership and, and leader McCarthy credit, you know, it's been a priority. I think that Parker Polling's done a bang up job mm -hmm. um, over at the NRCC. I think Congresswoman Brooks has done a bang up job of, over at the NRCC. Um, I don't think you'd see the successes that we, again, are, are really seeing through 2020 um, kind of against the odds without yeah. a sea change in attitude. So yeah. speaking of yeah. success, I would, just, I would, just, I would just yeah. quick underline that, and, and I, I agree 100% with Rebecca. And I'd also say that, you know, sometimes, sometimes when you see the, the, the playing field, you realize certain things have to happen. And certainly, right. uh, Leader, Leader McCarthy understands and Chairman Emmer, Emmer understands that the only way we're getting back to the majority in the House is on the success of Republican women. And certainly on the Senate side, we know the balance of power in the Senate rests squarely on Republican women. And so, you know, there's this added incentive that when it, you know, when it actually helps yourself and the team, you're more likely to engage. And so I think all these guys, you know, they love the idea of having Republican women, but was it a priority? Not necessarily. They certainly supported the, the good women, but right. now it, it's more of a, it, it's more of a let's look here because it actually brings us you know, a new vo voice at the table, it brings with constituencies we might not have been able to get. And I think they've really embraced that, which is terrific. Yeah, I mean, you can't find what you're not looking for in many respects, right? right? <laughs> so um, I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the success stories. Um, give us a sense of um, some of the, you know, candidates that are running, not the incumbents, but the new um, challengers that are running. Um, and, you know, which ones should we be watching over the next two weeks and um, and on Election Day? And what are those, some of those success stories and uh, who those candidates are? I'll start. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll take it over. Um, certainly the, the, the top five um, on, on the House side is actually pretty mm -hmm. easy. For the first time in history, uh, the top five most vulnerable incumbent Democrats in the House are being challenged by Republican women. And so mm -hmm. this is really exciting. And so that's uh, New York 11, which is Staten Island uh, Assemblywoman Nicole Maliotakis running. Mm -hmm. uh, New Mexico, Yvette Harrell um, running again. Uh, when we went to bed in 2018, Yvette Harrell was winning that race. Uh, we mm. thought she was coming to, coming to Washington, and she ended up losing when the absentees came in. Uh, Claudia Tenney in New York 22, running to get her seat back. Uh, she was a congresswoman from that district, and uh, Trump won the district. And so we, we have high expectations that, that um, Congresswoman Tenney will return. Um, and then a couple of the, the really, really competitive ones, which is Oklahoma 5, uh, where we have Stephanie Bice running. Uh, mm -hmm. This one is, is is really interesting because it's the most it's the most Republican seat uh, currently um, um, with with a Democratic woman sitting in it. Uh, what was complicated here is that it was a super competitive primary that went to a runoff, and so Stephanie didn't win the nomination until August. And so sadly, we've been sort of firing the guns internally instead of at the enemy. And so now it's you know all systems yeah. go. To Stephanie win this race. And finally, the fifth one is uh, South Carolina 5, um, where Nancy Mace uh, is running. She's the first woman to graduate from the Citadel. Uh, she's a state rep. She's a tremendous candidate. I mean, these five women are terrific. And they're, they have a, a, a di all of them have different backgrounds. Some have legislative experience, some don't. Some have military experience, some don't. Uh, we feel great about those five. And there's others, of course, but I'll, I'll kick to Rebecca mm -hmm. to add, add the ones she wants to highlight. Sure. Yeah, you know, um, I have to agree with that entire list that Julie just just went through. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that there are also a few open seats um, mm -hmm. where you're going to see some Republican women come through. Um, Florida Three, there's a woman named Kat Kamek. She's young, she's energetic, um, you know, she's a former staffer. Um, you know, I think that, you know, she's likely a member of Congress, um, Illinois 15, a woman named Mary Miller, um, Michigan 10, a woman named Lisa McLean, um, down in Tennessee, Diana Harshbarger. You know, these are, that number, we're starting at 11. Um, you know, that number mm -hmm. is going to tick up. Um, 11 sad, but, but, you know, I, I, we started off at winning for women with a goal of 20 and 20. Um, when I, when I came up with that, I'm like, oh, this is catchy. It's, <laughs> be hard, but, but it's catchy. Um, 
I, I, I don't think it's as out of the realm as it seemed in 2018. And frankly, yeah. it, we came up with it before we knew of two retirements and then it felt real out of reach. And now I don't think it's that out of reach. Um, it would, you know, it's still a high, a high bar, but I think it's yeah. doable. And that's due to all of these wonderful women who've stepped in the ring, frankly. Um, Julie, you mentioned Yvette Harrell out in um, New Mexico running again. Um, how important is it as you talk to candidates um, to actually run again? Um, you know, I, I feel like sometimes as women, um, we're maybe a little bit too easily discouraged sometimes. Um, but that running again is such an important component. And if, you know, if women, the women that are running this cycle, um, depending on where they're running, you know, it's a presidential year, which is sometimes more difficult. Um, but, you know, talk about that, the importance of actually um, running more than once. Yeah, you know, again, an upside from 2018 is that we yeah. had some tremendous women running who were not successful and we they wanted to come back and do it again. And so the only good news about that is you don't make the same mistakes twice. And so right. we have women running that some of them should have won last time and some of them this is a much better year for them to be running. So young Kim in California, Tiffany Shedd in Arizona, uh, mm -hmm. Karen Handel, former congresswoman from uh, the Atlanta suburbs running to get her seat back. Um, Yvette Harrell, of course. And, and so this, this is, you can't start with a team like that. You know, we, we already know that they're not, they're, they're going to have the right consultants, which again, is a really, it's a big deal. And, you yeah. know, it's tough for women that have never done this before to know where to start. You know, often the guys have, you know, a bench of other state reps or, you know, whatever it happens to be that their buddies are consultant and they'll hook them up. You know, this is this is a bigger challenge for women. And so uh, and there's only so many good consultants out there. And so, you know, it's a double edged sword. We've got all these great women. You know, unfortunately, we can't you know, Rebecca and I can't sit with all of them all day long across the country and, 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 and do all the things we'd like to do. I mean, that, that's good news, bad news. Um, the only thing, I, Betsy, you mentioned, you know, sort of the competitive races and yeah. the only thing I like because so much so much has been um, so much attention has been given to the, the historic number of Republican women we have running, right. which is great. But there's also some realities that go with that. So the Cook Report came out, which is, you know, pretty much the gold standard for, you know, tracking the horses, if you will. <laughs> uh, and so out of their toss up seats, the pure toss ups in this country, as of today, there are 26. That's it. And so right. the next one on their scale is lean. And so if you add in their lean, the Democrat, vulnerable Democrats in the lean column, that's another 17. So that gets us to 43. So out of mm -hmm. 435 House seats, we've got 43 that are competitive. And so out of those 43, we have 14 Republican women, which is a tremendous number. But when you're starting at 228, all of a sudden your numbers drop pretty pretty quickly. And so we have 94 nominees, 14 right. super competitive seats. Two of those 14 are incumbents. So uh, Ann Wagner running yeah. in the same suburbs, that is a pure toss up race. And as of today, Jamie Herrera Butler, Congresswoman Herrera Butler from Washington three, uh, that moved into a lean. And so these are two of our 11 incumbent women in the house in competitive races. And so, you know, I don't like to, you know, be Debbie Downer on this, but when we win and we are going to win a lot of these seats, it's going to be a huge accomplishment. And so I, I don't, I just, my fear has always been that the narrative is going to be, let's, let's elect 20. Let's say Rebecca's right. And it's 20, mm -hmm. maybe it's 19, mm -hmm. maybe it's 22, whatever that number is. We don't want the narrative to be, even though they had 228 Republican women running, they only elected 20. Right. You know, and so that can easily flip the script. Yeah. And so I just caution that you know, we're definitely going to make advantage, make, make bigger numbers here. We're going to increase our numbers in the House, um, but we're going to have to keep building. I mean, we're not yeah. going to elect 88 Republican women this cycle. I wish we were. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and the key is, and you've pointed this out before, I know, is that, you know, the import is having these women running in seats that are winnable, right? Um, and not just being on the ballot, if you've got a Republican candidate in a totally blue congressional district, yeah, that looks nice on the number of women, Republican women that are running, but if she doesn't have a shot, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, right? Right. Right. And that's, no, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, I would guess, though, that the upside of, of that, though, and why it still makes sense is because it is, I think, um, does go a long way, especially as we think about young women being motivated to run to actually see a woman on the ballot, right? Um, yeah. So I, I think you can take that both ways. What are your thoughts on that, Rebecca? Well, I, you know, again, I, like Julie, when we went yeah. to figure out back, you know, at the beginning of 20, 2019, what did 2020 look like? Um, yeah. You know, we wanted diversity within our endorsements. We wanted to make sure that we were putting an emphasis on quality candidate and we wanted right. to figure out wins. Um, you cannot, cannot, cannot build a movement within a party if you're fighting for your life every two years. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, obviously the Venn diagram needs to come together. You need to come up with candidates who, you know, are quality and are going to, you know, be good members of Congress. But you want, you know, at least a large chunk of those people that you're coming in and supporting to be in places that they can come in and really grow into leaders within the party. Um, and I think that that's going to be something that we see this year, um, you know, that list that Julie and I went through of yeah. people who I think are going to come in are women um, who do have that that ability. Um, I would also be remiss if I did not note, you know, Congresswoman Herrera Butler and Congresswoman Wagner are both two great members of Congress. And, you know, if anyone listening, um, you know, is lives in either Washington or the St. Louis area and, and has some time on their hands or a few spare dollars, um, you know, they, they both can and, and do merit, you know, your support. Um, they, they need the help, too. And, you know, it is as important for us to be supporting our incumbents as it is for us to be identifying yeah. and, you know, pushing new candidates in. Speaking of incumbents, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the vulnerable Senate incumbents that you all have. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly Martha McSally comes to mind, uh, Joni Ernst, Susan Collins, certainly. Um, how do you see some of those, and they're all in kind of these big marquee Senate races, how do you see sort of the state of play in, in some of those races? Yeah, so sometimes the Senate gets lost in the shuffle when we're talking yeah. about these things. But um, so coming into 2020, we have a historic record nine uh, Republican female senators mm -hmm. serving, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot. Um, that's the good news. The bad news yeah. is six of them are up for re-election. Um, it's sort of screwy the way things have worked out on the Senate side to have that many uh, in cycle with the specials mm -hmm. that are going on. And so you mentioned two of the top ones, certainly uh, the, the fate of the Senate rests in, in the hands of at least three Republican women. That's Susan Collins in Maine, Joni Ernst in Iowa, and Martha McSally in Arizona. And uh, you couldn't have uh, three stronger women that, are, that do more for their states than you could, you could ever imagine. And so uh, everyone is trying to help the three of them uh, come back to Washington. The big story here has been the money. Um, the money flowing into these races is just extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, Martha McSally last quarter raised $22 million, which is awesome. It's twice the amount she'd ever raised in a quarter before. The problem is that Mark Kelly raised 40 million. Right. Same is going on in Iowa. Joni was outraised almost two to one. Susan was outraised three to one. The, um, the challenger in, in Maine Sarah Gideon raised almost 40 million and, and Susan had raised a record amount. And it's just extraordinary. But it's it's funny mm -hmm. on, on the main race. I saw today that Sarah Gideon, this is a, a fun little fun little trivia facts. Sarah Gideon that's running against Susan Collins in Maine actually raised more money out of Portland, Oregon than she did out of Portland, Maine. So that <laughs> is going this cycle. And so uh, the platform on the Democratic side, Act Blue, they've yeah. got about a decade uh, on us um, in terms of online fundraising in that way. And so it's really been a struggle for us to keep up with the money. And states like South Carolina, you see the Lindsey Graham race, which impacts yeah. our South Carolina one house race. Right. You know, $58 million was raised against Lindsey right. last year. Yeah. Million. You know, yeah. how do you spend that kind of money? There's not enough TV channels in, in South Carolina media markets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should start with like, Buying cars to drive people to the <laughs> pool like, and let them keep them. Like, I, you know, I don't yeah. know what you're gonna what you're gonna do. But at some point, it stops being about you know who is the better person to serve in the United States Senate, and that's troubling. You know, that's that's really sad. And I going to Arizona, you know, 
Martha McSally has done more for the state of Arizona since being appointed in January of 2019 than just about any senator in the country. She is tied with Chuck Grassley for the most legislation passed. I mean, that's incredible. And as much as the COVID has sort of changed everything in our country, COVID is perfect for, for Martha in terms of what she's great at, which is rolling up her sleeves and getting things done. And so she has been in every corner of that state helping get PPP money in, you know, doing everything possible while Mark Kelly has sort of been sitting in his basement. I don't know if you actually have basements in Arizona, in his bunker, you know, not going out and the money's just been piling up. And so, you know, sadly, it's the messaging that's, that's out there. And if you buy enough messages and you tell the lies enough, people start believing it. And finally, just to put a finer point on it, you know, the polls in both Arizona and Iowa have been pretty much been the same. It's 47, 47, 47, 47. And so both I, both Joni and Martha are fighting over the 6%. And we'll see. I mean, we have 13 days until the election. You know, some of the internals on, on both sides have us up a couple. Some internals have us down a couple. But, you know, those races that are going to absolutely go down to the wire. I'll bring up the literal elephant in the room here is the Trump component, right? And um, what impact does that have um, on some of these races? Certainly, it's probably had an impact on the fundraising that you mentioned that the Democrats have been able to do, right? Right. Yeah. Hey, Rebecca, why don't you take that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you can't ignore that the president has an impact on candidates in, in 2020. Um, some a very good impact on candidates and in other places, uh, you know, a, a tough impact. Um, you know, as Julie mentioned, I think in the places that we are unfortunately watching several very, very, very good um, U.S. women senators, uh, you know, the, the dynamics have been tough. Um, you know, that is an opportunity for an organization like Winning for Women to come in. Um, you know, for mm -hmm. instance, in Iowa, um, you know, we've been able to come in with the Action Fund has been able to come in with some outside money. Um, it pales in comparison to the ability of, of you know, the just vast, vast online fundraising machine. Yeah. Uh, on the other side. But again, I think this is uh, the cry for why organizations like these are needed. Um, you know, you, you do, especially in a year that feels like a bit of a wave year, you need to have this infrastructure that's going to be able to come in and, and raise the army and help your candidates, um, particularly ones like a Senator Ernst, like a Senator Collins, like a Senator McSally. Like, these are good women members, guys. <laughs> like, and they're, they're doing so much. As Julie pointed out, they are doing so much for their home states. And it's sad. You know, we saw it in 2018 as well. Um, and the, the, the fundraising machine often will just come in and decimate. And, and look, we as a party have a lot of work to do. I mean, our, our troubles with women predate 2016. Um, it's it's not helping, <laughs> but, yeah. but you know, this is something that we as a party need to be focused on and it's a long game and I think we're playing it, you know, and I, I think we're doing well. What um, impact, if any, do you think that the Supreme Court uh, pick, uh, Amy Kimmy Barrett, um, has had on any of these races or just in general um, spotlighting, you know, more conservative uh, Republican women? You know, we frankly, I think it served as a motivator for the bases on both mm -hmm. sides um, mm -hmm. with those, you know, those few coveted swing votes in the middle. I don't think it's had much of an impact, frankly. Um, Julie, I'll throw to you. <laughs> That's why too. Yeah, I no, I, I, I totally yeah. agree. I think that it has motivated, you know, some conservative women who might not really love the president's rhetoric but understands the importance of getting another conservative justice on the court. And I, I think that those women that might be hedging their bets a little bit, I mean, there's only one way they're going to vote now when they show up. And so, I mean, the same right. can be, be said on the, on the left, and it's just sort of, you know, which, which numbers are going to get out in, in greater force. Yeah. So I, I think it's about a, a draw on that. Let me take a couple questions um, from the audience here. Um, Here's a question from Caitlin. Uh, she says, how do you think President Trump's rhetoric about women has affected your voting block or recruiting block, particularly with diverse women? Let's take a stab at that. You know, I would, I would say it has, yeah. I mean, it hasn't. I mean, yeah. you know, either if, if you if you love President Trump, you're motivated to come out and, and, and support his policies and, you know, and wave the flag and, and, and do those things. And if, you, if you're not a huge fan of the president, that motivated you as well, you know, to come out, you might like his policies, but you wanna show that, you know, not all Republicans necessarily look like Donald Trump. And so, you know, it depends where you are in the country. As Rebecca said, you know, it's really helpful candidates and some other candidates, it's been more, more challenging. And so, 
you know, one of the things you can say about Donald Trump, um, you know, on the on the plus side, is he definitely demonstrated that you didn't have to have some sort of pedigree or resume to run for uh, federal office. You know, and I think that actually was a huge motivator for a lot of Republican women who, you know, oftentimes on the Republican side, people sort of climb the the the, um, the, the ladder of running for state house or mayor and, you know, waiting your turn and coming up. And a lot of women were disadvantaged to that because they didn't run for their kindergarten class president and serve, you know, all the way through the way guys did. And so now mm-hmm. all these Republican women realize, look, I don't, I don't have to wait around. I don't have to allow the guys to, to do this because they've been a state rep for 20 years. You know, I have something to offer and I'm going to get out there and run. And I think so. I, I think that on that that piece of it, the Trump factor yeah. has been great for women. Rebecca, anything you want to add on that? You know, I'm going to totally dodge the question and go to um, Julie's point of women jumping in. You know, I, I, let me tell you, this is not our first rodeo. (laughs) Um, You know, it is so incredibly important for women to feel the ability to run for Congress. Like the men, and this is cliched and something I've heard a million times over, but I think it's worth repeating you know every man every male candidate we talked to is like oh yeah i could totally do that look i could run for president it's been done (laughs) and the women tend to not have that same confidence and i agree with julie wholeheartedly that we are seeing just a broad range of women with all sorts of different atypical frankly resumes that are coming in this year which i think is awesome um and i hope that that continues i mean and I, i think it will um you know, you, you can't help but see the impact of women like you on the airwaves and women like you it's sitting in Congress. Like, that's going to promote, promote more women. Um, and so, yay. <laughs> Go us. Susan me, Collins, well, Senator Collins used to, used to tell a story that she had an opponent, a male opponent, uh, yeah. a couple of cycles ago. And she used to joke that he would claim he had foreign policy experience because he drove a Toyota. And so between <laughs> men and women, you know, women want to make sure they know all the issues yeah. in depth yeah. and yeah. guys just, you know, they tend to wing it more. And so uh, that, that's, again, the good news, bad news about female yeah. candidates. We're going to be much more engaged on the issues. <laughs> um, here's a question from Carol. Um, she says, my dream is for two women to be the presidential candidates in four years, say Harris and Haley, Nikki Haley, I assume she's talking about. Uh, if that were to happen, with, um, which means that we'd have our first woman president, how would that help your cause in terms of more Republican um, women running to see a strong Republican woman um, as a nominee for president? I mean, <laughs> immeasurably. <laughs> <laughs> Especially that lineup. I mean, you know, yeah. Nikki Haley, I think, is a, a, a bang up role model for pretty much everyone. So, um, I, you know, again, I, 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 I'm a broken record, but seeing yourself makes a difference, mm-hmm. and seeing mm-hmm. yourself at the highest echelon um, of, of of government, I, like it just that, it will have infinite, infinite um, power of of having women, you know, feel so that is a, a, a viable path for them. So, you know. Here's to, here's to hoping. Yeah. Have you seen some of the other Republican women office holders be effective in campaigning for um, other women up and down the ticket? Like a Nikki oh, Haley? Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, you know, the funny thing, of course, is that everything is different this cycle because of COVID, right? You right. can't get out there as much as, as you used to. But one of the great things that's happened is that all of a sudden Nikki, Nikki Haley can appear on a town hall with Martha McSally. And mm-hmm. you can be anywhere in the country and help each other. And the women have really done that. They've really come together to, to try to help each other fundraise and give credibility to certain mm-hmm. ca- candidates that they yeah. might not have had otherwise. And so it's it's one of those you know weird things that have come out of this that have really it's really helped our women. Um, yeah, and I want to I want to go back to Congresswoman Brooks. I'm um, sitting yeah. in the recruitment chair position at the NRCC. You know, take a, a place like in Oklahoma Five. Um, New Mexico three, there are several places where your your two top contenders in the primary were women. I mean, we knew mm-hmm. early on that both of those races were going to have, you know, we were pretty sure that there was going to be a woman sitting there. And frankly, given their, their general election matchup, I think they were the better candidate to be able to take on those seats too. So, you know, I think the focus on women members you know, really guiding the process has had great effect. Um, and you see it, you know, kind of even in these early stages where you see some of these primary matchups, 
um, where it, it was much as it was difficult to watch, you know, both Stephanie Bice, um, you know, get beat up on and, and, and beat up on her very capable opponent. But yet we knew that, you know, she someone was going to come through. And yeah. that's great. That's a good problem to have. Um, let's see. Here's a question from Sydney, um, who says, as the election approaches, we've heard a lot of talk about Trump losing the support of white suburban women voters. Uh, how can the Republican Party better act to gain the support of this important voting bloc? I put more women in and talk to women voters. Um, you know, I it, it's I think that one's by no means simple, but yet simple. You pray, Julie. Maybe we can stop calling them housewives. I mean, that'll help. Yeah. <laughs> that would help. Somebody um, was quoted today, I think a professor um, at USC that made an interesting point on that topic. She basically said that that call out to suburban housewives was less about appealing to suburban housewives than it was about appealing to men, male voters in sort of the, you know, um, you know, big macho man um way of thinking about things does that I, I thought that was an interesting point that maybe that that was an appeal more to men um than actually to women absolutely without <laughs> question you know the, the there have been lots of dog whistles you know in yeah. this cycle and you know with a keen ear you can pick up on yeah. these things yeah absolutely <laughs> there's no question and you know the thing about the suburbs is that you know, if, if you still think about the suburbs as sort of um, leave it to Beaver, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're playing it wrong. You know, that's not what the suburbs look like anymore. And so, you know, I think to try to, to, to lump them all together is a mistake as well. Um, we've got some great women who represent the suburbs. Um, you know, th this goes back to how we started this conversation, though. You know, there's only so many competitive seats. The, the swing seats tend to be some of these suburban seats. And so last cycle, the Democratic women were so successful you know, we're targeting them this cycle, not because they're women, but because those are the most vulnerable incumbents. And so for, for those that believe in actually achieving parity in Congress, which I do, I, I think that the Congress is, you know, should be more reflective of our country, more diverse. Right. And so, you know, I've talked about this before, but it doesn't bring any joy that our great Republican women are going to take out uh, Democratic women. You know that doesn't help us achieve parity, and so yep. uh, I would much rather be going after the you know the middle-aged white Democratic guy. I mean that would be a lot more fun, and I think that you know having more women in Congress, we're just going to get more done uh, on mm -hmm. both sides of the aisle. And I think if you ask any of the the Democratic freshmen, they they certainly wish they had more Republican women to work with. Yeah. So how does how do you retain more women in the party? Because a lot of women have left the party and are now actually identifying more as either independent or as democratic. So how, especially in this era of, of Trump, how do you, what is the, the message that um, to retain more women in the party? Are you talking voters, Betsy? Or, yes. or yeah. members? Yeah, I'm talking voters. Yeah, um, you know, that's a great. Again, I'm going to go back to my broken record statement of you do need to see more women there. Um, I do think that the country wants to see itself in Congress. And as Julie aptly pointed out, when you see a party of old white men, that doesn't happen. Um, I do think also, though, you know, my gig before I came over to Winning for Women was to figure mm -hmm. out messaging to women voters. And mm -hmm. there's a there there. Yeah. You got to be talking to women about the issues that are important to them. Um, you know, Julie used the word or the term dog whistles a few minutes ago. You know, those aren't those aren't gonna talk to women voters. You, you do need right. to think about the issues that are important to them. Um, you know, COVID's clearly one of them right now. The economy is one of them right now. But, you know, sometimes when you look at economy too, that's not necessarily being filtered through women's voting preferences in the same way it is for men. Um, you know, I we if you look in some of the recent polling, uh, you know, men, tend, male voters tend to be more supportive of Trump on the economy. I don't know whether this is, you know, 100 percent true or not, but I think that the typical, you know, male voters perhaps looking at just at the performance of the stock market, whereas your, you know, your woman voters, you know, tending to be probably multitasking both with her job and her family and all the above and looking more at what the bottom line of the household looks like. So, yeah, you know, I just think that women voters tend to think about these things in a little bit more complicated and nuanced way at times. And we need to, when we're messaging to them, we need to think through that and, and talk to them. Like, that's just, you know, the Democrats figured it out. We got to do it, too. Yeah. I mean, there's a similar question here from Julie, who says, how can Republicans better communicate its policies around health care, education and the economy? 
which are but, some yeah. of the issues that their women care about, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, all issues are women's issues. We talk yeah. about this all the time. And yeah. it, we have, you know, no offense to, to, to Rebecca's old line of work, we're not great messengers. And so like, everything she <laughs> you know, I'm not saying you were great, Rebecca. I mean, everything you did. <laughs> but, you know, there's just, we make things too complicated. You know, women want to know, just like guys want to know, when are the kids going back to school? You know, when, when can I go to my restaurant down the street and sit at the bar? Like, I, I want, I, these are the things I want to know. I don't need to know, you know, exactly how many dollars and cents are going into some PPE trillions of dollars here and this bill there. I mean, nobody understands that, nor do they want to. All they know is that there's fighting in Washington, things yeah. aren't getting done, their kids are, you know, working from the living room and, you know, nothing is the same. And how are we going to get back there? And so, you know, Democrats historically have been very good at that simple messaging, whereas Republicans haven't. I, I think we've been right on the on the policies. We've just had a really difficult time explaining them. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Um, and and frankly, you know, I, at times when you're coming in trying to explain a tax benefit and you're getting into the nitty gritty and numbers and why this loophole works, et cetera, like that's not going to resonate. <laughs> we need to yeah. figure out yeah. simple messages yeah. that explain it. And, you know, in a soundbite, <laughs> not not because our voters and are not capable, and not overplay people. the soundbite. So, so yeah. Democrats yeah. Agree. Agree. tend to overplay the soundbite, the whole you know, uh, defund the police, you know, this whole thing yeah. that that's very catchy and that worked for a while. But at the end of the day, you know, we kind of get it. Like not everyone wants to defund the police, but, you know, there needs to be some reforms. But, you know, people get to the point where they don't believe anyone. You know, they, they just think that it, it's all, you know, propaganda and we don't know what's right and what's wrong. You know, I know, you know, my friends, the police officers, I know my friends, the other first responders. And so you need to, to be realistic about this stuff and, and also understand that, you know, messaging to someone that lives in the suburbs of St. Louis is a very different message than somebody living in, in, in Des Moines. You know, they're right. not facing the same issues. And so right. we just got to get better at the messaging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a question about sort of the challenges of women running for office um, from Victoria. And she says, as a woman who's been empowered by my surroundings growing up, I'm curious about the obstacles that women would genuinely face as opposed to men um, in running for congressional seats or other seats. What is one recurring problem that you observe? Money. <laughs> money. Money, money for sure. And uh, that's a huge one. We talked about the, the, the assumption that a woman is less conservative. The other thing, there have been studies done on this, that, that if you are a credible guy and people don't like you, they'll still vote for you. But right. if you're a credible woman with great issues, if they don't like you, they won't vote for you. And so there's a very yeah. thin line that you have to walk between this likability and still being, you know, coming off and being as smart as you are and not dumbing yeah. it down because there's a lot of jealousy factors around that that women deal with that men don't. Um, I, I would guess that very few guy candidates have ever been asked, well, if you win, who's going to take care of the kids? You know, it's, I mean, there's a lot of that. And it, it, it's some of that has gone away, but not all of it. And that, that the, the thin line that women walk between being confident and being the B word and people don't want the B word. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a different yeah. it's a different game that they have to play than, than guys do. And do some of those issues impact Republican women more? I would assume maybe that the children, who's watching your children kind of question, right? I think so. I mean, we even saw it. Let's go back to that North Carolina three race. You know, yeah. you you had this woman who was just like assumptions were thrown at her right and left, um, including I, there was a you know a New York Times article right before the the, the special. Um, and here was a, the person interviewed was in, 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 in until the very last statement that the reporter had with them. And she was like, I don't know, though. She's a woman like, eh, <laughs> like maybe not. You know, I, uh -huh. I just think that sexism is still there. Um, we need to figure out how to overcome it, obviously, as a people. I mean, as a party, too, but as a people. Um, and I, you know, I'm going to put a blatant plug in for organizations like all of ours here. You know, the fact that we are looking at women, figuring out ways to create opportunity for them, figuring out how to help them get around these obstacles. That's how we are going to start to change that that story. Um, right. And, you know, baby steps. This is again, this is a long game, sadly, but it is. I'm curious. Um, 
if you guys can take off the Republican hat for a second and just evaluate how uh, Kamala Harris has been able to navigate some of those gender issues um, being the vice presidential nominee. You know, it's been tough for her. Um, I, I will, I will not cite the profile of the person I'm talking about, but it might be a family member of mine. Um, after the first debate, um, you know, this person was like, "Well, I thought she came off really aggressive," and I was like, "You did?" I'm like, "I think she came off like a pretty confident prosecutor, which is what she was." Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that she, first of all, I think she's a candidate who has matured um, pretty significantly from the the primary process to now. Um, but I think she's still got, you know, a bit of an uphill battle, particularly with older voters. Um, yeah. You know, that's I, I think that younger voters probably see her differently. Um, I, you know, I also saw some interesting polling um, this week that showed kind of, you know, breakdowns of men versus women in different demographic groups of how important they thought that, you know, the vice presidential pick on the other side was a diverse woman, mm -hmm. um, you know women voters were much more likely to see that as being an important thing um, than, than their male peers. So, you know, again, that, that, those obstacles are just very much still there for her. Um, but I, I, I think she's doing pretty well. What do you think, Julie? I, I agree with Rebecca. I'm just gonna leave it there. <laughs> the, the, only thing I, the only thing I would add is, you know, we, again, we try to make this too complicated. You know, yeah. if you're a Republican, you hate Kamala Harris. If you're a Democrat, you love her. I mean, right. it's just everybody, everybody has their jersey on, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And it's yes. hard. And, and, you know, anything she says, it's going to be accentuated one way or the other, depending on how you, you feel going into it. And look, right. it's, it's hard to run for office. It's hard to run for any office, you know, let alone the highest stage in the land. And so... You know, McSally would say, you know, every day I wake up and 50 percent of the people love me and 50 percent of the people hate me. And it's the people that hate me that I'm going to hear from. And so yeah, it's yeah. hard. I mean, this is a hard life. And, you know, we, we joke about the candidates often and we, you know, ins you know, wonder how they can do or say what they do. Um, it's a really tough job. And it's the first conversation I have with any candidate that comes in front of me. You know, which is, wow, you seem really normal. Why do you want to do this? You know, why do you want to put your family through it? And so, you know, I'm always, you know, do you, you know, do the tough the talk? Do, Say, you sorry? Have, do you do sort of the tough talk to candidates or are you trying to actually persuade them? Or are you trying to realistically give them a sense of what's ahead? I do or both. both. I mean, yeah. you know, I, my only, you know, my only goal is to make candidates as good of candidates as they can possibly be. I mean, yeah. I had a tough conversation with a couple of candidates this cycle who, after they got in the race, I told them, you, you, you're not going to win. You know, this, this is not good. It's a waste of your resources. It's a, it's a waste of your family's time. And they pulled out. And, you know, they might run for something else down the line. But, you know, I'm not into the kamikaze thing. And I'm not in this per participation trophy. You know, I want the best candidate out there that has the best chance of winning. You know, in some of these seats, Rebecca and I have talked about it. You know, the, the guy is actually a much better candidate. And so I don't get involved in that race. You know, I might, you know, yeah. talk to our, our female candidate a check, but I'm not going to engage, you know, too much in that race. I mean, we want our, our best women coming forward so that going back to your point, there are idols out there. There are role models. There are people to look up to. I mean, that's where, that's where I spend all of, all of my time is, is helping these great women win and not, you know, for me, it's about quality and not quantity. Like someday, I hope that we can start, you know, picking off our in, our incumbent guys. You know, once we have 150 Republican women in the House, we can get rid of some of the bad incumbent Republican guys. But, it, you know, we've got a long ways to go between now and then. Um, well, I want to let everybody know um, before we go here of a couple other um, Women on Wednesdays that we have coming up and we hope you'll join us for this. Um, next week, we are going to talk to the filmmaker and um, a few activists that are in her film. It's called Resisterhood. Uh, it's uh, about the um, takes place mainly about the women's march um, after the 2016 elections and looks at a couple women who um, are involved in activism and um, she uh, the film is just now out and if you register you can also get a link to watch the documentary ahead of time and these are some of the women that are spotlighted in the film so we hope you will join us for that next week and then we are going to do a post-election look 
uh, on November 11th. I didn't want to schedule it for the Wednesday after the election because who knows if we're going to know anything by then. Um, so we have scheduled it for November 11th um, with Emily Ramshaw, who is the CEO and uh, co-founder of the 19th. Uh, which is a terrific new news organization dedicated to reporting news uh, about women uh, and Rebecca Becker, who is their Washington correspondent. So that'll be uh, on November 11th. So we hope that um, everyone can join us for that as well. So with that, Julie and Rebecca, we want to thank you uh, so much for spending some time with us this evening. And uh, we will be watching on election night to see to see what the voters say. Thanks, Betsy. Thanks, thanks for having us on. Thank and thanks, everybody, for watching. Take care. Thank Hope you. To see you next week. Okay, bye bye.